In this video, I want to talk about depression. Webster's 1828 Dictionary uh, gives this definition for depression. A sinking of the spirits, dejection, a state of sadness, want of courage or animation, as depression of the mind. Now, this is actually my second time trying to make this video because for some reason something didn't go right with the first one, even though I thought it was very well. So that's almost enough to make someone depressed itself or at least discouraged. But no, it's, uh, it will be done by the grace of God. Praise the Lord. Um, we have all experienced depression in some form or another through, throughout our lives, uh, I'm sure. Uh, Though it may be, uh, you know, different lengths of depression that we may have went through, and it may uh, vary in the severity of the depression that we have suffered, but I'm sure that everybody at some point in their life or another, uh, at some point or another, has suffered a, a moment of depression. And uh, we probably will again in the future. Uh, so that possibility is always there. So I want to look at some stories in the Bible and, and learn some, some common causes of depression and some biblical cures for common depression. Um, so to begin with, we're going to look at the common causes of depression, and we're going to examine some great men of faith and some stories where they suffered moments of depression. And the first one that we're going to look at is Samson. Okay, He is one of the great men of faith, uh, mentioned in the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11. And so let's start reading in Judges chapter 15, verses 1 through 20. Okay. Actually, I want to look at one verse before chapter 15 in Judges, uh, which would be Judges chapter 14, verse 20. But it says, But Samson's wife was given to his companion, whom, ha whom he had used as his friend. So Samson's gone, and while he was gone, his wife was given over to another man, to a Philistine. And uh, so that's kind of the back, the back story to this story that we're going to read. Now let's go to beginning in chapter 15, verse 1. But it came to pass within a while after, in the time of wheat harvest, that Samson visited his wife with a kid, and he said, I will go into my wife into the chamber. But her father would not suffer, would not suffer him to go in. And her father said, I verily thought that thou hast utterly hated her, therefore I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. So, uh, here, uh, Samson's wife's father says that uh, he gave her over to his companion because he thought that Samson hated her. And verse 3, um, And Samson said concerning them, Now shall I be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure. Now, so in the King James language, someone reading this, uh, you know, might not really understand what's being said here. Samson said concerning them, Now shall I be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure. What he means here is that his revenge would be just. Okay, Samson is ticked off and he wants revenge on the Philistines because his wife has been given over to one. And so this means that he would be justified in what he was about to do. He will be more blameless than them, even though he will do something bad to them. So, uh, verse 4, And Samson went and caught three hundred foxes, and took firebrands, and turned tail to tail, and put a firebrand in the midst between two tails. And when he had set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing corn of the Philistines, and burnt up both the shocks and also the standing corn with the vineyards and olives. Okay, so he went to the crops of the Philistines, their harvest, with foxes, and he put basically basically torches on the foxes and let them run wild through it and just set the whole thing ablaze. Okay, he just destroyed all their harvest. Um, so, verse 6, Then the Philistines said, Who hath done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines come, came up and burnt her and her father with fire. So now they went and they killed his wife and her father. So that's pretty crazy. Uh, verse 7, And Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. 
And he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and he went down and dwelt in the top of the rock Edom. Then the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah, and spread themselves in Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why are you come up against us? And they answered, To bind Samson are we come up to do to him as he hath done to us. So Samson went and... Uh, and, and hid and so now the Philistines are coming after him and the men of Judah are wondering what's going on in verse 11 then 3,000 men of Judah went to the top of the rock Edom and said to Samson knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us what is this that thou hast done unto us and he said unto them as they did unto me so have I done unto them and they said unto him we are come down to bind thee that we may deliver thee into the hand of the Philistines and Samson said unto them swear unto me that ye will not fall upon me yourselves he's saying that um, swear that you won't kill me and so in verse 13 and they spake unto him saying no but we will bind thee fast and deliver thee into their hand but surely we will not kill thee and they bound him with two new cords and brought him up from the rock and when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became as flax, that they burnt with fire, and his bands loose from his hands. Okay, so I want to take a moment to talk about the Spirit of the Lord here. The Spirit of the Lord uh, is the Holy Spirit. And we see this phrase, we see these phrases throughout the Bible, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, and every time they are talking about the Holy Spirit because if it wasn't talking about the Holy Spirit it would just say the Lord or God or Christ it would say the Lord came mightily upon him but it doesn't say that it says the Spirit of the Lord so we're talking about the Holy Spirit and when we're talking about the Spirit of the Lord we're not talking about an aura of God or an essence of God because personal attributes are ascribed to the Holy Spirit such as the Holy Spirit speaks the Holy Spirit has a will the Holy Spirit teaches so somebody's essence or somebody's aura doesn't teach people it doesn't speak to people so the Holy Spirit is a person It's the third person of the Trinity and by saying the third person, we don't mean that it's somehow less. It's just that's always, uh, whenever the three persons of the Trinity are mentioned together, um, the Holy Spirit is always the last one. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it is the third person of the Trinity. And I also want to make notice, make mention that the, when the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson, this was for an empowerment, an empowerment of great strength. We see that he broke the, bound, the bands that were holding him together. And so this is not the Holy Spirit indwelling Samson. This is not when Samson got saved. Because there are many instances in the Old Testament when the Holy Spirit came upon somebody and that was for a special empowerment. And in the case of Samson, it was for strength. But um, people will take these verses and they'll try to teach it that people in the Old Testament could lose their salvation because the Holy Spirit came upon them and then it left them. It, it's never for indwelling. It's for uh, empowerment. So... We need to understand that uh, everyone in every dispensation is always saved by grace through faith. Though that content of faith, what they believed in, may have changed. It's always been by faith, uh, you know, by grace through faith. And, uh, and because of that, because it's always been of God's grace, nobody could ever lose their salvation. They are kept by the power of God. Okay? Um, so that's important to understand. There are many misunderstood verses uh, on the Holy Spirit, and there is a lot on my website about that, and there's more that needs to be added, and in the future I'll be doing plenty of teachings on the Holy Spirit. We definitely need to get a correct understanding of the Holy Spirit. And so let's continue with the depression and the story of Samson here. So the Holy Spirit came mildly upon him. He broke these cords that were put on him by uh, the men of Judah when they delivered him over to the Philistines. In verse 15, and he found a new jawbone of an ass and put forth his hand and took it and slew a thousand men therewith. And Samson said, with the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps with the jaw of an ass have I slain a thousand men. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and called that place Ramath Lehi. So uh, you know that's another example of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that he slew a thousand men with the jawbone of an, uh, of an ass. So 
Verse 18, And he was sore athirst, and called on the Lord, and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst, and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? So, I think Samson was already saved at this point, I think, because he called on the Lord. Uh, so, he was previously saved, uh, and I think him calling on the Lord kind of gives an example of that. Uh, as evidence that he was saved. But we know that ultimately Samson was saved because he is mentioned in Hebrews 11. Um, and so verse 19, But God clave in hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water thereout. And when he had drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived. Wherefore, he called the name thereof Enhekhori, Enhek which is Lehi, which is in Lehi unto this day, and he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines, twenty years. Okay, so I want to specifically look at Judges chapter fifteen, verse eighteen, where it says, "And he was sore athirst, and called on the Lord, and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst, and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised." And we're going to learn the first common cause of depression is that depression often follows exhaustion. Okay, Samson was physically and emotionally exhausted. After a great personal victory, his attitude declined quickly into self-pity. He, so he says, shall I die for thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Emotionally, we are most vulnerable after a great effort or when faced with real physical needs. Severe depression often follows great achievements, so don't be surprised if you feel drained after a personal victory. During these times of vulnerability, avoid the temptation to think that God owes you for your efforts. It was His strength that gave you victory. Concentrate on keeping your attitudes, actions, and words focused on God instead of yourself. Now let's look at another great man of the faith whose name is Elijah. He is mentioned many times uh, in the New Testament. He is quoted and he... Uh, well, I guess uh, he's mentioned and so... <laughs> he did many great, wonderful miracles, okay? So let's look at 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1-9. through 9. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. So previously, uh, Elijah was having a battle with the prophets of Baal, and they were battling over whose God was real. And so they took a sacrifice, and Elijah said, you know, you call upon your God to consume it, and I'll call upon my God. And, you know, whosoever God does something... Um, they have the real God, okay? And so, of course, um, the God of Israel responded to Elijah, and he consumed that uh, sacrifice. And then the prophets of Baal were slain. And then um, Elijah had a prayer for rain that was answered. So... Um, We'll read again in chapter 19, starting at verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets of the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So that is a threat from Jezebel to Elijah, that uh, he would be dead by tomorrow, just like all the prophets that were killed. Um, so... Verse 3, And when he saw that, he arose, and he went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under the juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him, and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for thee. Now every time that we see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament it is speaking of a manifestation of Christ in the Old Testament. And we can understand that because there are a lot of attributes uh, that are the same with the angel of the Lord and with Christ. And uh, so uh, I need to do a study on that in the future. But 
Let's continue, verse 8 and 9. And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Herob the mount of God. And he came thither unto a clave, and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? So I want to look at specifically... 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 3 and 4. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And we're going to learn here the second common cause of depression is that depression sometimes follows great success. Elijah experienced the depths of fatigue and discouragement just after his two great spiritual victories, the defeat of the prophets of Baal and the answered prayer for rain. Often discouragement sets in after, great, uh, after spiritual experiences, especially those requiring physical effort or involving great emotion. To lead him out of depression, God first let Elijah rest and eat. Then God comforted him with the need to return to his mission, to speak God's words in Israel. Elijah's battles were not over. There was still work for him to do. When you feel let down after a great spiritual experience, remember that God's purpose for your life is not yet over. So the two common causes of depression that we have learned is depression often follows exhaustion in the case of Samson, and depression sometimes follows great success um, in the case of Elijah. So now let's go on to look at some biblical cures for common depression, and we're going to read from Psalm 42, verses 1 through 11. Psalm 42, verse 1 through 11, As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. And that's a verse where we get that great hymn, um, As the deer panteth uh, for water. So uh, the heart is a deer. And verse 2, My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me, therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan, and of the Hermonites from the hill Miser. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me and my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As the sword, as with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. So, the, uh, we w I want to look specifically at Psalm 42, verse 5 and 6. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites from the hill Miser. So, the first common, uh, the first biblical cure for common depression that we learn from Psalm 42 is depression can be relieved by meditating on God's Word. Depression is one of the most common emotional ailments. One antidote for depression is to meditate on the record of God's goodness to His people. This will take your mind off the present situation and give you hope that it will improve. It will focus your thoughts on God's ability to help you rather than on your inability to help yourself. When you feel depressed, take advantage of the Psalms antidepressant. Read the Bible, read the Bible's accounts of God's goodness and meditate on them. 
Next, we learn from Psalm 42 that depression can be relieved by patience. Later in the psalm, the writer tells his own soul to be patient. There are plenty of reasons from the past to trust God. In spite of the discouragement of the moment, the author is convinced that God has plans for tomorrow that are better. The fa- that fact may not make the darkness bright, but it, make, but it may make it more bearable until the morning. And the third common cure for depression from the Bible, or cure, biblical cure for common depression, is depression can be relieved by expecting God to act. The psalmist confidently closes this song with a statement of hope in the midst of difficult emotions. He may not feel like it, but he knows that he will again have plenty of reason to praise him for all that he will do. Why art thou cast down on my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. So, once again, the, the common causes of depression, two of them are depression often follows exhaustion in the case of Samson. Depression sometimes follows great success in the case of Elijah. And the biblical cures for common depression learned in Psalm 42 is that depression can be relieved by meditating on God's Word, depression can be relieved by patience, and depression can be relieved by expecting God to act. So, I hope that you have learned something, brothers and sisters, and there will be more studies on depression and uh, how to deal with that from the Bible. Thank you for watching. God bless. Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven.